We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Alistair McLeod, Head of Research at Gold Money. Alistair, thanks for joining me today. That's my pleasure, Tom. So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about gold's move last week. You know, we saw gold move up quite a bit, but as you wrote about in a recent article, we haven't really seen the miners hedge their positions. So why would this be? Well, it's an interesting one because, um, I mean... Uh, yeah, I mean, I put myself in in the shoes of uh, of um, a gold mining um, operation. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you're managing such a thing, really, what you're what you're interested in is paying the bills, cash flow, and all the rest of it, and you don't want the risk uh, of not being able to do that. And that is why you go into the futures market and you sell your production forward, so that you get you know you can guarantee um, the value of um you know of your gold or your silver or your nickel or your copper or whatever it is you you've mined um so that's that's the reason that you go into it now the fact that they're not doing it i think is means that um you know perhaps one up up from the managers of the mines um the board boards of directors are beginning to just sort of half understand um what's going on and um, the full understanding, which I think they're stumbling towards, is that it's not gold going up, it's the dollar going down. Mm -hmm. So they've got to look at the mining operation and its costs and returns in that context. Now, the dollar going down basically means that um, costs which are quite sticky, things like wages, um, things like machinery and so on and so forth, those aren't going to go rise immediately along with it. So that's that's good. Um, on the other hand, you've got things like um, energy, you know, oil, um, the energy input, if you like, which is such an important part of mining. Um, that is a wild card. So what you could do is you could cover your position on, you know, in oil futures by buying it forward. So you can see that you know, this is a sort of multifaceted thing. Once you begin to get the idea that actually what's happening is it's not so much gold going up, but it's the dollar going down. Now, I think it would be too much to say that um, the directors of mining corporations um, uh, already look at it this way. But I think this is the direction in which they're stumbling. And um, on that basis, uh, you know, when they get a call from... You know their favorite bullion banker saying, "Would you like to cover your position forward?" They say, "Well, hmm, yeah, we see the Chinese are buying. We see this buying. So I think we'll just hold off for the moment." And I think this has been interesting because it, it what it's meant is that the um, producers um, category uh, uh, on the commitment of traders um, uh, report, um, you know, they've been gradually reducing. Their, their um uh, forward you know forward cover um selling forward and what this has done is it's left the swap category which are basically the bullion bank trading desks in the majority and if, you know a few other market makers types if you like um left holding a short position in the market and um so this is really rather uncomfortable we haven't seen open interest on comics really saw yet i mean it sort of got over just over 500 contracts on the gold contract but um you know it has been quite a bit higher i would say over 500 is probably getting a little rich but could go quite a bit further and you know you know that's the sort of feeling so there's by no means does the market feel overbought in that futures market um of course that's only one eighth roughly um, of um, uh, the derivative markets, the balance being in London. London's far, far larger. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, I think, I, I regard uh, COMEX as being the canary, if you like, in the in the gold mine, <laughs> to paraphrase it. <laughs> um, and so on that basis, um, I think, you know, this is interesting. I think we're probably seeing the bullion banks um, getting in increasingly sticky position. I mean, the you know, the... the 
the gross shorts are in the order of, I don't know, 50 billion or something. I can't remember what the exact figure was. But I mean, this is huge. S- uh, spread between what, 29 parties. I mean, you know, this is this is um this is big. I mean, we're not quite two, two billion average each. And some of those will be considerably less and others considerably more to make up that average. Mm-hmm. So this is not a comfortable position for the establishment, if I can put it that way. And having the getting back to your point about the um, you know, the producers, the mines not um covering forward, um, I think it's just you know, it's making it doubly difficult for them. So the squeeze, I think, is going to be on the shorts as things develop, as say the Fed's pivot continues or signs of it continue, mm-hmm. you know, continuing. Um uh, uh, um, are you know sort of become um, that much more obvious, and I think I think that um, this is going to be extremely difficult for the bullion banking um, community. So that's um, that I think is the important point to realise about um, you know what uh, you know the, the absence of hedging, and I don't think many people seem to have really noticed it, but it's it is it is a very very important feature. I'll just. There have been several factors put forward driving the gold price higher. And one such explanation was the fall in reverse repos. So why do you see this as an inadequate explanation? Well, I I think it comes from a misunderstanding as to what um, role the reverse repos have been playing. Um, Basel III regulations, um, the net stable funding um, requirement um, uh, basically uh, says, and this is the Basel III rules, that large deposits are risky uh, simply on the basis that if you've got, say, someone has, um, uh, you know, puts a large deposit in the bank and they withdraw it, it could create a liquidity crisis for the bank. So, which we've um, seen. <laughs> <laughs> which we've seen, which we've seen. Well, yeah, we've seen. Um, but it's interesting because uh, the Basel rules now go the other way when it comes to the idea of pe- people queuing up, the, you know, around the street to take their money out of the bank. You know, that's no longer a risk. That is the most stable form of funding you can have. And actually, they've got a point because we don't queue, queue around the block to take money out of the bank anymore because the bank teller says, "Sorry, regulations." Regulations, you know, it's not no, we haven't got your money. Regulations, so they hide behind regulations. But the point is that large deposits are not favourable to the banks. Um, it's it's um, it's a bad source of funding for the asset side. So they effectively have not been willing to take on the money market funds in the money markets um, because okay, you know, you pay the money market fund whatever the going rate is, but it appears in your balance sheet as a deposit. You know, you, you know, this is not good uh, funding, and this is why um, outfits like J.P. Morgan have set up Chase Banking in countries like the UK for the retail banking. You know, this is this is stable funding as far as um, Basel III is concerned. So that is why the Fed opened up the reverse repo facility to money market funds to give them the alternative, if you like, to, um, uh, you know, uh, seeking, um, you know, secure uh, uh, deposit, you know, deposit facilities through the money markets. Um, Now, so, uh, you know, you saw this facility run up to about two and a half trillion. um, And then since then, I think about what last year or so or 18 months, it's declined to around about what, 650, something like that, 60, 50 billion. Lots of people seem to think this is very, very um, dangerous and there's something weird going on. But all it is, is they get a better return by buying T-bills. You know, you can get something like 5.4% on a T-bill. And that's, what, six months. You know, that that is actually what you want as a, as a money fund. And that's where it's been going. And this is why, despite uh, we see the... Um, uh, the, the uh, you know government debt rising to close to 34 trillion. This is why there doesn't be, appear to be any funding problems. If they go out into the market and try and fund 30 years, yeah, that's not quite so easy. But T bills, no problem. That's where this liquidity has come from. Now you could probably make a case that once that liquidity dries up, then we're going to have to get into a new phase of um, of government funding. Um, and I wouldn't argue against that. That could lead to certain difficulties. Um, 
But I think think at this stage we can only guess what they might be. <laughs> I think I think there's no point in speculating about that. But I would set everybody's mind at rest that the idea that uh, this sort of collapse in outstanding reverse repos it doesn't actually mean anything more than that. It's money just shifting into the treasury bill market, and um, Biden and Co saying, "Well, thank goodness for that. They're still lending us money. Okay, it's costing five point four percent, but you know who cares? Who cares? We just borrow a bit more." You know, as you're talking about interest rates, Alistair, we've heard before that higher interest rates are bad for gold. How does your experience of the 1970s contradict that? Well, it's very, very simple, Tom. I mean, we went into the 1970s with gold at $35 an ounce, and uh, the Fed funds rate was about six, five and a half, six. It subsequently went down to about three. But then it rose at the end of the decade to, what, 19. Um, And what was the price of gold at the end of the decade? It hit 850. The idea that, um, you know, high interest rates are bad for gold, I think, can only really apply um, in uh, an inherently stable credit system. In other words, a credit system where there is very little threat to the value of credit from Whatever economic developments that may, may be in case, you know, in 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 the pipeline, and this is um, this, of course, was the difference between the 1970s and the decades that followed it. In the 1970s, we um, uh, came into the sort of world of fiat currencies. Um, there was considerable uncertainty. Uh, you had um, uh, rocketing oil prices. Um, and all the rest of it. Uh, And so there was this period, if you like, where faith in the fiat currency was by no means guaranteed. And there were times when that faith came under very, very strict pressure. Um, So under those circumstances, yes, um, there is absolutely no link at all between um, what, let's say, a dollar pays you, a dollar deposit pays you, and uh, what you would get on gold, let's say, by leasing it out. You know, typically, you're looking sort of 5, 6, 7, 8% as against a gold lease rate of, I don't know, sort of half percent to 1.5%, maybe even 2%. So, you know, that spread, that spread at times of uncertainty and concerns about the purchasing power of a fiat currency, that different differential is completely meaningless. But if you have a stable situation, such as we had, particularly um, in the latter part of the the 80s, through the 90s, and so on, then, you you know, if um, uh, interest rates rose, then what you were looking at, quite simply, was, um, uh, you know, the bullion banks would, um, if you like, uh, buy gold or obtain gold through leasing, sell it in the market, um, the cost of the lease was around about 1%, maybe 1.5%, and they could invest it in US T-bills uh, to get 6%. Mm-hmm. And it was a big carry trade. I mean, it really was. Um, and uh, this was behind uh, the um, uh, the stories, uh, which, so far as we can see, have been actually very, very well um, uh, documented as, as being correct, that the central banks were leasing gold into the market, um, such that by 2002, Frank Venerosa, the um, uh, analyst who really looked at this in great, great depth, uh, reckoned that anything between 10 and 14,000 tons of gold had been leased into the market. And the way he put it is probably adorning the necks of Asian women. In other words, it had gone forever. Mm-hmm. Now, um, this um, I don't think that um, subsequent to, to that, that gold has gone out of the system in that way, quite in that way. Um, but there's no doubt about it that there is still this black hole of leased gold. Now, that 14,000 tons in 2002 was half total world gold reserves. Um, Today, you know, I mean, I don't know what the figure would be, but certainly uh, the behavior of um, uh, the the, uh, um, New York Fed when it came to Germany demanding its gold suggests that some of the leased gold had actually disappeared, if you like, from its faults. And uh, it had compromised the position of um, uh, the Bundesbank and probably various others. So, you know, this is this is a story which um, I think is going to continue. But to get back to your point uh, about 
the relationship in interest rates, we are now, in my view, entering a period of instability for credit, which in many ways is kicking off in the same way uh, as uh, we saw in the 1970s. So you can disregard this. I mean, for example, let me give you, a, for example, um, uh, there are signs that um, the Americans are sending um, aircraft carriers to uh, uh, the Red Sea, towards the Red Sea, towards Djibouti. Uh, and uh, Yemen at the, that pitch point. Uh, and um, so what's going to happen? I mean, are they going to stop the Houthis from attacking ships? How do they do that? Well, they'll probably have to bomb Yemen. I mean, you know, one way, or Aden. They'll, they'll just have to, uh, you know, bomb it or something. If they do that, then they bring um, uh, Iran into, into uh, the conflict. And what will Iran do? Well, I know what they plan to do, and that is they plan to close the Straits at Hormuz. So you can see that suddenly, you know, forget interest rates, forget what your treasuries yield, you know, and the spread over what you can get on gold. We got to get out of dollars. We have got to get out, you know, get into real money, which is gold. So you can see how suddenly the priorities are shifting very, very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I think there's a very strong possibility that this Middle Eastern situation is now going to escalate because the Iranians have very um, cleverly, in a way, um, played the Houthi card. They're behind the Houthis. There's no doubt about that at all. They're providing them with the drones and everything else. The Houthis are having a gay old time capturing ships and you know doing, doing you know two fingers up to 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 um, uh, the Israelis or any Western uh, entity which um, they think might have a connection with the Israelis. And, um, you know, as far as the Iranians are concerned, they're doing a proxy war the way in which we shouldn't do it in um, in the Ukraine. I mean, the Ukraine, we were on a dead loser backing the Ukrainians right from the start. Um, but this one, this one, um, you know, the Red Sea, this is very, very serious and could lead to major disruption uh, in the oil, uh, you know, uh, over the, over the um, uh, supplies of oil to the West. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get to exactly that point, Alistair, but, you know, just sticking with the idea that this, in a way, this dovish pivot from the Fed has affected things. There has also been a fall in the DXY by 200 basis points, you know, in and around that really market announcement, let's say. Yeah. How has this affected the yen carry trade and what does this mean for the entities doing that trade? Yeah, uh, um, we don't know the quantities, obviously, but mm -hmm. um, you know there is no doubt that one of the easiest ways of making lots and lots of money in recent months has been to borrow yen, um, which probably costs you half a percent or something, you know, if you are a bank or if you are um, a major hedge fund uh, or a bank operating on your behalf. So, um, you know, that's, you know, peanuts. And you invested in, you buy, so you sell your yen, which you've just borrowed, buy um, dollars and invested in, in T-bills. And T-bills will give you 5.4%, as I was just saying. So, you know, that's a clear 5%. And you leverage it up. What five times? You know, you're now getting twenty five percent return on your underlying um, interest. Um, you know, why not ten times? I mean, you, so you can see this. And oh, and the other thing which was wonderful about it is that as long as the Japanese um, Bank of Japan uh, dug its heels in, you know, the currency was going your way as well. Wow, you're making huge. I mean, you know, not only were you getting getting the 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 yield pick up but you're also you know getting a um you know a collapsing yen i mean this is fantastic mm -hmm. until the music stops mm -hmm. and that i think is probably what we saw um with the fomc statement um uh or following it uh, the, uh, the the speech by jay powell because that very clearly showed that the fed is beginning to get slightly less worried about inflation, more worried about employment, and with 2024 being effectively um, a presidential election year, things have got to change. There was probably been quite a lot of pressure from uh, Janet Yellen at the Treasury. So you can see that you know the whole thing is shifting a bit. Now, um, I think 
what Jay Powell wanted to do was, if you like, sort of satisfy that political objective without triggering too much of a response in the markets. But we all said, hey, ho, he's done it. He's given it. Wow, we're off, off to the races. Mm -hmm. You know, buy stocks, buy this, buy that. So you know, we all got terribly excited. Um, and then uh, uh, John Williams, uh, I think, was sort of sent out to uh, you know try and calm things down because that was not quite the reaction that that uh, uh, the Fed wanted. So, um, but there is no doubt at all that the Fed's priorities are changing. Mm -hmm. What this means for the carry trade is that those wonderful profits you were making, whoops, they're now going down, they're getting lost. Why? Because it's costing you a lot more to buy back your yen. I mean, the yen has fallen from 150 down to, I haven't seen it today, but I think it's about 141 or something like that. Now, these moves are quite sharp. And this, of course, getting back to your point about um, the trade weighted index and the dollar has been reflected in the trade weighted index of the dollar. So we've seen a 5% fall in what, two or three weeks? I mean, that is actually quite a significant move on any measure. Um, the interesting thing, Tom, will be to see whether uh, this triggers more selling of the dollar by foreigners who are very, very overweight US dollar assets, hugely overweight. I mean, we, we know the, um, the, the, the uh, Treasury tick figures show that foreigners own between um, you know, long-term investments, short-term investments, bank deposits, around about 33 trillion, of which I think about 14 and a half is in the stock market or equities. Um, we know that they're no longer um, quite so keen to buy US treasuries. Um, but on top of that, you've got to look at the positions in the foreign exchange markets, which are classed as derivatives. Now, that's a further, I mean, I haven't actually looked at it since uh, the Bank of International Settlements did a bit of research on this. Um, but in June last year, I think we were looking at about 85 trillion, where the dollar was on one side. Now, in effect, with the dollar on one side, that is the equivalent of a bank deposit. Whether it's the bank or whether it's in the shadow banking system is neither here nor there. But that's what it is. There is a commitment, a credit commitment there in dollars which is um, outside America and therefore, um, uh, if you like, owned or um, uh, uh, due to uh, foreign entities. So you've got to add that in. Plus their investment in um, uh, uh, euro bonds, of which, again, looking at other sources, I've, um, you know, we're looking at something like 10 trillion on top of that. So there's a good $125 trillion. Now, this is four and a half times the size of the uh, of US GDP. You know, and this is in foreign hands. Are they going to sit on their hands and say, well, you know, if the dollar goes down, we'll buy more? Mm -hmm. I doubt it. Uh, there is another point, actually, because uh, quite clearly the world is, is going into recession. I think a slump is probably a better, a better description, um, but we'll see. Um, and under those circumstances, the requirement to hold foreign currencies actually diminishes. So the dollar will be sold. Of that, I have absolutely no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, so the question remaining, after January the 1st, will the foreigners increase their selling of dollars or not? And I think one thing that's very, very interesting, and I, this is this is just off the top of my head, This is there's no deep thinking behind this. But I have noticed the number of times that markets have turned on a dime on the first, second, or third, or fourth of January. Now, we've had this huge, great rise in equities. It wouldn't surprise me if, um, you know, there's a bit of sort of, you always get this new year, you know, buying for the new year. I mean, I remember when I was a broker, we used to get orders from all sorts of idiots, you know, to buy stock, um, you know, after Christmas. I don't know whether they were full of Christmas cheer or whatever it was, but they were, you know, they just wanted to buy stock. Um, and then, full you know, of, full of you get a, I mean, it's wonderful as a broker, you know, because <laughs> I get, I was getting commission on this stuff. But, you know, you knew from the quality of buying, you knew that this new year buying, I mean, because all the newspapers give new year tips and all the rest of it, you just knew that this was, you know, um, false. It was rubbish. And sure enough, um, in the very earliest days of January, you would see the peak in the market and then it was downhill from there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes downhill bigly, as Mr. Trump would say. <laughs> Alistair, where do you see the biggest weaknesses in the banking system right now? You know, obviously, 
as we mentioned earlier, we saw some of banking failures in the U.S. this past spring. But how are the banks in Europe positioned as well? I remember seeing mumbles of UBS being in trouble after absorbing Credit Suisse. So what does that financial situation look like in Europe? Um, well, I, I haven't looked at UBS specifically. I think they're far, um, they're far worse candidates, if you like, uh, within the GSIBs, the global systemically important banks. The the ones which are most highly leveraged are the French and the German uh, GSIBs, um, and you're looking at um, uh, uh, balance sheet ratios of um, you know assets to equity. Um, very often in, in excess of 20 times. The Japanese banking system is in the same condition, incidentally. So, um, th- you know, the, it. I mean, this has sort of really come about because the, the more a central bank pushes down interest rates, suppress interest, suppresses interest rates, um, the more it impacts the lending margins or the credit creation mar- margins, if I can put it that way, of the commercial banks. So, um, you know, if you're um, a director of, say, Deutsche Bank or something like that, or one of the Japanese banks, your response basically is to increase your leverage in order to maintain your profitability at the bottom line. Now, that's fine until interest rates start rising. You get a sort of temporary windfall from it, from rising interest rates, because your margins begin to expand. But then you get all the malinvestments amongst the people you've uh, loaned money to, and um, that comes back to bite. If you have got so bored with just boring lending that you've gone out and bought uh, corporate bonds and you know treasury debt and all the rest of it, with you know sort of say wandering out of the one year horizon which any sensible banker would not go beyond, but they've gone a long way beyond, as we saw with some of the regional banks. Um, you know, then you've got big losses. And also, you were probably funding it at, um, you know, when you had zero interest rates uh, from the from the Fed. Um, and now uh, the cost of funding is 5%. So you've got a hit on the PL account as well. So the situation, I think, is one that um, evolved into an initial hit, which was more to do with, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, the purchase of, of, of debt with some maturity in it um, and the way it was funded uh, on your balance sheet. So that was the first hit. And that is why we saw that some of these re- regional banks getting into, into difficulty. So far, um, I think it's been pretty well covered up in Europe. Um, and I think that's an important point. Um, we haven't seen any rumbles coming out of Europe, but I can tell you that the situation in Europe is at least as fragile, if not more so, than it is um, in the US banking system. Mm-hmm. I think we then approach the second phase of um, a, a bank lending crisis, because now what the banks are doing is they're running scared. They don't want to lend to anyone anymore. They'll lend to their governments, because according to Basel regulations, you can lend to governments, and that is a high quality asset. So you know, again, it's, it's driven by regulations to a large extent. But what it does mean is that you cut lending to uh, businesses up and down the country. And um, what do those businesses do? Well, you know, they find that their customers have no longer got finance. Um, they've no longer got finance. Basically, they're all going bust. Mm-hmm. So that is a situation which is now in the pipeline and is going to hit, I think, in 2024. I think it'll hit the banking system very, very hard. Now, it is a fundamental um, duty of modern central banks to ensure that there are no failures in the commercial banking network. The idea that you can, um, you know, let some go and others not. uh, 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 No, no. We discovered the fallacy in that idea when uh, they let Lehman go. Well, I don't think Lehman was actually a bank at that stage, but or it wasn't a a lending bank anyway. So this... um, this is a situation which the authorities are going to have to pick up. Now, what's the kind of, that going to do to the credibility of credit um, unanchored to gold? Well, I think it's quite quite simple. I think that the faith in that credit and therefore its purchasing power declines, um, and it declines probably quite rapidly because there's a lot of cross-border unwinding of positions to take place. 
Um, and uh, under those circumstances, people would be going up. No, it's not. It's credit going down. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most important message for anyone looking into 2024, when they're sort of thinking gold's going up. No, it's credit. All the risk is in credit. And um, it is because it has become completely detached from reality. Let's put it that way, let alone describing reality as gold. Mm -hmm. Alistair, you bring up the idea of central banks really, in some ways, providing stability and being a, let's say, a parent to the regional banks. You were before we hit record here today, kind of sharing an idea with me that central banks are actually more of a modern invention. So what is the what is the alternative look like? <laughs> well, um, well, where have we got to? Where we've got to basically is that um, in America, the Fed was founded just before the First World War. The Bank of England was founded, well, 1700 and something. Um, uh, but the Bank of England only really became a central bank in um, any sense of the word um, following the 1844 Bank Charter Act. And it was that that basically um, uh, uh, ensured that the, the, that the Bank of England had to maintain a certain level of gold reserves against its notes, notice here. Um, that worked um, apart from three times. Um, it was suspended three times in 1847, three, three years after the Bank Charter Act came in, um, 10 years after that, and uh, so that was 57, and then 1866, when we had a banking crisis with uh, a bank called Overend Gurney, which um, uh, went belly up, and it was, it, was, it was enormous. I mean, it was like rather like J.P. Morgan <laughs> going, uh, going bust. Um, uh, but apart from that, I mean, the the system worked quite well. But really, the problem, I think, is that while a central bank can be constrained by a gold standard, um, it also constrains the politicians. And you will have upsets because nobody really sort of, as in the past, has designed a gold standard properly to withhold these things. We now know how to do it, incidentally, by the way. And Steve Hankey understands this when he is talking to people about putting in a currency board, mm -hmm. uh, replacing a local currency in effect with the dollar. You know, he understands how to do this. You do exactly the same with gold because, you know, a gold standard was the um, forerunner, if you like. Of uh, of a currency board. I mean, it was the British Empire that basically did it. Um, you know, it was the way uh, in which uh, a gold-backed um, sterling was linked with um, currencies uh, in in our colonies. Um, so, you know, that's that's quite simple. But now that we're no longer on um, a um, gold standard, the primary duty of a central bank, um, putting aside that you know all the regulatory stuff and all the rest of it is basically to fund the governments because the governments are now spending a lot more than they can possibly collect in taxes without being thrown out. So you can see that um, the role of central banks has changed and they are now predatory when it comes to um, uh, the private sector, when it comes to ordinary commerce. They are debauching the currencies um, on instructions from the politicians. Now, what all this stuff about central banks being independent from government is a load of guff. Who appoints? Who appoints Jay Powell? Who appoints you know, the, the, the governor of the Bank of England? I mean, the answer is the damn politicians. So um, central banks are not independent, and we're going to see this with the Fed particularly in 2024. And so I've just stated, I suspect that the reason that we're having a, a Powell pivot at the moment is partly because of those political pressures. So um, the, it, this is very important. And what we have had, and I think that the majority of central banks were really set up in the wake of the First World War because gold standards were suspended. Um, it continued with America. God bless America. They actually continued with it. But in Europe, um, you know, basically gold went out of the window entirely. Um, we then had fiat currencies and we had central banks. And we've been lumbered with central banks ever since. Now, when you think that banking was invented by the um, Romans, and in this form, it probably started with the um, uh, invention of double entry bookkeeping, which was late 13th, early 14th century in Italy. 
So the Italian banks started creating credit out of thin air, as it were. It's a tradition which we've all continued, which is fine. I'm not knocking it. You know, this this is this is something which is which is free markets. You know, you want to go borrow some money, and let's say I'm a banker, and you come up with a good case, then I create it for you. The point is, I've got to be able to clear the other side of it. Okay, fine. That's 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 not a problem. So. Um, Central banks, actually, in that context, are a very recent innovation. And given that um, they have uh, progressively increased regulation as a means of trying to control what they see as the problems of free markets, which actually are problems they have created themselves, I feel absolutely convinced that the end of the fiat currency era, which I think we're rapidly approaching, will also see, and it should see, the end of central banks, because really they have no role in um, uh, in, in in trying to suppress interest rates, uh, whatever. Um, they don't understand commerce. They don't know what um, uh, you know actually drives uh, demand for uh, credit. And a lot of them don't seem to understand the difference between money and credit. So we've got this sort of, uh, you know, bizarre system, uh, which is ill-informed, trying to do a job which it just cannot do. And the sooner that the central banks we got rid of, the better for all of us. And what is what do, what do we replace it with? Well. <laughs> There's only one answer. We've got to go back to free banking. And that does mean, incidentally, doing away with the regulations, doing away with things like licenses even. Why, why does a bank have to have a license? I mean, the answer basically is that, um, you know, the government will uh, only give you a license as a bank if you support the government and help it finance its debts. No, that's completely wrong. It shouldn't be like that. No. So I'm a great advocate of returning to free banking. And if a bank gets itself into trouble, basically, it's got to sort itself out. It's not something that you and I, who have no interest in that bank whatsoever, should be involved with. Mm -hmm. Seems like more of a local solution for local problems would be a better idea for yeah. that type of bank. Yeah, and it's actually it's regulations that have um, driven uh, banking away from one of its primary functions. I mean, you know, in the bad old days, <laughs> you, you'll understand. I really mean the good old days. Um, you know, a bank would under you know would be local. Um, it's certainly the management of that bank would be local, um, and it would understand um, the people in that locality. It would know who to lend money to, who not to lend money to, uh, and um, it would be, uh, if you like, um, probably one of the most important components in local business, providing the credit, oiling the wheels of trade, business in the locality. And um, we've got away from that. You know, the whole thing has uh, just moved away. And, you know, if you're a if you're a small or medium sized business, you know, what, um, who do you turn to for credit? Uh, you know, the banks just, you know, I, you forget it. They just don't service that anymore. They're far more interested in playing the markets. They've become financial behemoths, if you like, um, rather than, um, you know, lenders um, to to industry. Alistair, what else do you have your eye on for the coming year? You know, I read this morning that the LBMA is planning on launching a new metals contract using prices from the Shanghai Futures Exchange. So do you see a time in the future when the gold price is set by the East? I think it probably is quietly. I mean, the reason we may not think it is, is because the East has been very canny about the way it buys gold. Um, basically, it doesn't chase the price up. If there's some available, it takes it. You know, it just quietly cleans us out, if you like, um, when we get bored with it. Um, as to uh, the LBMA, I mean, they've gone woke. I mean, I, I kid you not. Um, well, as all institutions in the West have, you know, you can't move without having, you know, having to produce some sort of statement about, you know, how environmentally responsible you are and all the rest of it. Now, um, you know, what it's meant, actually, is that the LBMA has basically lost market share, particularly to places like Dubai. It's, I mean, the physical market in Shanghai, yeah, I mean, it lost that completely. 
And we've even seen uh, uh, um, uh, Chinese banks backing out of the, LME, uh, uh, of the LME gold contracts. Um, but, uh, you know, when you look at an outfit like Dubai, um, I mean, that's fascinating because that's a free market. You know, they don't question where the gold comes from. You know, whether it is artisanal miners, let's say in the middle of Africa, being treated badly by, um, you know, some gang master, or um, whether it's a Russian oligarch, uh, you know, buying it on the other end or or selling something he's stolen. Or what. They don't give a damn. They really don't. I mean, I attended a conference in Dubai quite some time ago. And uh, um, also, there, I think there are about four or five manufacturers of uh, gold smelting kits is the way I'd call it. I mean, you could spend something like $10,000 um, on buying your own uh, gold um, uh, smelting and refining processor. <laughs> you know, they're doing this in Dubai, for goodness sake. I mean, it's... it's um, and of course, you know, I mean, gold uh, is being sold throughout Asia. And do you go, you go into the gold souk in, in in Dubai. I mean, it's just it's staggering the amount of gold that you know they turn into jewelry, and they just sell it by weight. I mean, there's none of this, um, you know, none of this, uh, um, you know, it's got Tiffany stamped on it, so we're going to charge ten times the. <laughs> the gold value, no, it's just sold by weight, and um, it's big, big market, and of course. You know, we've got uh, uh, the whole of Asia is just watching the, you know, the, these clowns in, in the West, <laughs> you know, with their fiat currencies and thinking, well, you know, this is a joke, isn't it? i have better just go and get some more gold. Um, so, uh, you know, the LBMA, LBMA can swing as much as it wants and shout and scream and think, well, we're going to do a Shanghai contract. But, oh, honestly. I think it's a dying. I think it's. I think it's dying on its feet. I really do. I know they do an awful lot of trade. You've got the. You've got the establishment in there and all the rest of it, and they do incredible turnover on very, very little real gold. Um, they tried to get. Um, they tried to get preferential treatment under Basel III, and uh, they were told in no uncertain terms, <laughs> "No way, mate." You know, so um, it, you know, and I think that, if you like, was uh, um, uh, the view from uh, the Bank of International Settlements of the veracity with which that market is actually run. I mean, they were trying to trying to persuade. Um, the uh, uh, you know the, the Basel Committee that um, a forward contract in gold was as good as delivery. Yeah, you know, they they just got laughed out of the room. I can tell you. I mean, I actually know someone who was involved with that, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's quite amusing anyway. <laughs> so probably a considerate way to wrap that up, Alistair. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really see this time as a battle between the dollar and gold? And is a return to gold in some ways a vehicle through which to at least, at very least, transfer value from one system to another? Uh, no, I don't really see it um, like that. I mean, the, the effect is that there is a transfer of value, yes, obviously. But um, you have to bear in mind that gold is legal money. I mean, you know, the, the um, eponymous JP Morgan himself said, you know, gold is money and the rest is credit. Mm -hmm. Um, that was true in 1912 when he made that statement, as it is today. Legally, gold is money and the rest is credit. The problem comes when you detach credit in terms of its value from gold. We've been like that now for 52 years. And uh, the only reason that this detachment has lasted this long is because of the propaganda and the bullying efforts of um, the American-led financial system uh, to try and dissuade us that gold has anything to do with the financial system anymore. It's a pet rock, they say. Mm -hmm. No, if you delve into the law, you will see the reason, for example, that it's on the balance sheet of the Fed at $22.22 to the ounce is because that is the official price of gold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, if gold was a pet rock, it wouldn't be there or they would value it at market, but no. So, and this is also why when it came to the Bretton Woods Agreement, Nixon could only suspend it. He could not 
um, completely denied or follow it up with, with, with legislation saying gold is no, no longer money. Mm -hmm. No. And this is why we have um, in our currency, we have a statement on our on our paper notes saying, I promise to pay the bearer the sum of, and it's a bit of a £10 note, £10. And that is in gold sovereigns, by the way. That's 10 gold sovereigns. Promised from the Bank of England, and it's signed by the chief cashier. Now, that is still on every banknote because it is a legal situation. Mm -hmm. Gold is money, the rest is credit. And this is why I think it's desperately important for people to realize it's not gold going up. It's their dollars, their pounds, their euros, the yet, whatever it is, going down. And when they go down and there is nothing to stop it going down because of what their government's doing to their currency, um, then you know, there's going to be no end of it. And uh, I can't really see any practical way in which uh, the US government in particular can return to the situation. I mean, from ev every which way. Look at um, uh, the fact that they've been denying uh, that gold is money um, in defiance of the legal position. You have the whole of the economic establishment not understanding m the difference between money and currency. You have got um, the geopolitical situation because um, you know the Russians and the Chinese understand that gold is money. They have been they've been accumulating gold for that reason, and they have substantial reserves which are not declared as official reserves on the balance sheet of their their, their central banks. Um, the geopolitics of um, you know of of a dollar price shooting up from the American point of view, I mean, are just too horrendous. They're not going to encourage it. They want to discourage it, but they've got a problem. How do they deal with it? You know, and um, I, I was fascinated with the Argentinian situation with with um, President. How do you pronounce it? Miley. 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 Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm a wordsmith, not a pronouncer. You know, I, <laughs> I don't speak Argentinian, um, but uh, you know, he's. He's um, he's in a fascinating position because um, uh, you know he's he's doing the right thing by ditching the peso, ditching the central bank, and going onto a currency board. Um, but uh, all I can say is that um, the dollar is, if you like, just a few steps behind the peso in terms of its credibility. So I think um, as a plan B, and this guy, he seems to be me to be pretty sensible. Um, if he survives politically, because remember, in Argentina, when um, you know democracy gets out of hand, the, the military come in. So you know, <laughs> this isn't necessarily going to turn out good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think um, he will probably have to switch over to to, to gold at some stage. Um, but they've only got sixty two tons, so I would expect to see him in the market buying a bit of gold. Yeah, I remember looking at that as well, and sixty two is. Correct, as far as we can tell. Alistair, well, it may not be there, of course, Tom. <laughs> that's that, That's why I said as, as far as we can tell, right? There's always that caveat, unfortunately, that we have to put there. Indeed. <laughs> Alistair, one of the other threads I wanted to close with you is, you know, these escalating tensions in the Middle East or Europe here. You know, Ukraine really, in some ways, disappearing from the news, being replaced, of course, by the Israeli conflict, how yeah. how does that that situation really start affecting energy prices if things in the Suez Canal, for example, really heat up and start getting blocked? Well, um, as I said earlier, uh, I think that this looks like it's escalating in a rather concerning way. Um, I mean, the Houthis have been taking pot shots at shipping uh, going through the straits there. Um, Another interesting point is that the Chinese actually do have a military base at Djibouti just across the straits, um, along with the Americans, I think probably the Russians, I think probably virtually everybody's got some sort of military presence there. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the Houthis having a, a pop at these ships is causing serious disruption. Mm -hmm. um, there was a spike in the oil price, was it yesterday? Where are we? We're Tuesday, yeah. Um, yesterday, I think there was a spike because uh, uh, BP, British, British Petroleum, announced that um, it was going to have to ship round the Cape, Cape of Good Hope, uh, which adds an extra 
I suppose, two to three weeks on the voyage um, from the Gulf. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would expect BP's petrol stations to to not have very much stuff to sell for a brief period of time until the ship, ships get round. Um, so that's one example of, of, of the disruption. Um, uh, we seem to be getting reports that um, uh, NATO forces are sending reinforcements to the area to try and protect the shipping. Um, the Houthis uh, apparently had a, had a shot at uh, one of the British destroyers and, and uh, they managed to deal with that, you know, great, wonderful. <laughs> But um, the problem, I think, is likely to be that um, this, I think, could la lead to um, an attack on the shore. Um, you know, the bombing of Aden, for example. Even maybe um, Navy SEALs, um, SAS, you know, RSAS guys being landed and doing actions, you know, doing all this sort of stuff. That, I think, would be very, very dangerous for the very simple reason that this is a proxy war which is being fought by Iran. Um, and uh, uh, I think that um, it, this would rapidly escalate into a situation where the Iranians would uh, close the Straits of Hormuz, which means that no oil would get out of the Gulf at all. This is, um, so this is a very dangerous, dangerous time. Um, you're mentioning Ukraine. I mean, the problem with Ukraine is that um, not only has it disappeared from the headlines, but the Western press has been g'd up by the security forces to support us to, to support the you know Ukraine um, against those beastly Russians. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, the beastly beastly Russians seem to be winning. So um, you know <laughs> this is a problem. Uh, we've got to back out of this one. And from what I understand, um, and this is sort of background information, the. Um, military on both sides actually do have back channels. And I think that um, if there is a resolution uh, coming out of this, it's probably going to be between the generals on, on both sides. Um, I mean, from the Ukraine, Ukrainian military's point of view, I mean, they've killed so many of their young men. I mean, it's just this is it just cannot go on. on. That's mm -hmm. quite simple. Uh, now, if the military um, effectively uh, uh, agree a ceasefire with the Russian military, then this is effectively a coup d'etat against uh, Zelensky and Zelensky's toast. Um, at that stage, I think we find that um, the whole of the NATO support just, you know, it just evaporates. It just goes away. Mm -hmm. um, so that actually for President Biden would be not... A very good outcome. I mean, he, when he came in, first thing he did was um, he created this awful scene in Afghanistan of just leaving like that, um, leaving your responsibilities behind. Uh, and um, I mean, we remember those awful images of people clinging onto the undercraft of planes, you know, trying to get the hell out of it, and then just dropping from the sky. I mean, it was it was ghastly. I think Biden's facing a similar situation over Ukraine in uh, this uh, his election re-election year. Um, so that I'm afraid I think is the tragedy of Ukraine. Um, that was a proxy war which was brought about by us. I mean, we we encouraged the you know the various revolutions going all the way back. I mean, uh, Victoria Newland. I mean, just look at the things she was saying. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, this is. It sort of reminds me of Doctor Strangelove in you know in in that um, satirical film, <clears throat> which was based on Werner von Braun, you know the the V two Nazi scientist <laughs> who um, you know the sort of mad um, scientist you know sort of driving us into World War Three and all the rest of it. Um, Victoria Newland seems to me to be sort of that. Um, you know, running that sort of line. Um, so th the Ukraine situation, I think, is a great tragedy. I see that ending in 2024. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the way it'll end is that we'll, there will be an agreement between uh, the military side of Russia and uh, Ukraine, um, irrespective of what Zelensky says. And I think Zelensky, basically, it'll be a coup d'etat. He will be out. The Israeli situation, I think, is extremely concerning. 
I think that um, uh, the Israelis have been extremely unwise um, in attacking Gaza the way they have. Um, okay, um, Hamas is um, you know is a terrible organization and all the rest of it. Um, but um, I think to an extent, and this has got all got lost in the reporting, there was provocation um, uh, at the Alaska El Aska Mosque um, in Jerusalem uh, with settlers. Uh, beating Palestinians and all the rest of it, and that was that was before uh, Gaza kicked off. So, to some extent, I think Gaza was triggered by that. Now, this is not something that's being uh, talked about in the in the Western press. Mm-hmm. But you've got something like two billion um, uh, Muslims around the world who know exactly um, this story and uh, are watching this really horrified. We are the minority in this story. We really are. And I think this is actually recognized in a sense by um, uh, uh, America and also us um, and uh, and uh, other members of the Western Alliance, uh, which is why they've, you know, they haven't sort of gone in and really sort of supported Israel. They've sort of uh, made the right noises, but uh, not really come up with anything more than that. And I think that's a measure of the the difficult diplomatic situation we have over this. Mm-hmm. I don't see us actually supporting the Israelis um, in this fight. I really don't. I and mean, if we look, look at look at the position in France, for example, they have got a huge Muslim population, which basically uh, came out of Algeria when that was a French colony, uh, and the French have never integrated their their minorities. Um, you know, they they have failed. Uh, in that very, very important respect. I mean, it's not like America. It's not like uh, the UK. I mean, in France, there are ghettos, literally. Um, So, uh, you know, this is a huge problem. And also, um, you know, thanks to our wonderful wars in the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and all the rest of it, we have got floods of refugees, and they are um, 99% Muslims. Um, so you know the disruption from this, from our point of view in in in, in Europe, um, we don't want to. See, you know, this is like you know we're going to go in there. It's rather like stepping into an ant's nest. I mean, forget it. So that's um, that's going to be a very difficult one. But the sideshow over the Houthis, that's the one to watch. I'm afraid, and that's the bit that really worries me. I think that might just bring uh, America, um, uh, in particular. I mean, obviously backed by us as well, because we say yes to everything America does um, uh, uh, against Iran. And I think that's um, that's going to be extremely dangerous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like I remember even, you know, going into the Ukrainian conflict, it was so difficult to actually understand the history of this, not just Putin bad, Ukraine good. And I think that applies to many of these conflicts. Mm. Um, it, it's such a difficult situation to fully understand for most people that don't have that full context, right? Yeah, it, I think that's right, Tom. But it's it actually comes down to one thing, and I think that's uh, energy and other resources. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I have no evidence for this, but it seems to be commonly stated. Uh, and um, I think that uh, there's bound to be some truth in it, and that is that America wants to unlock, for its benefit, um, the resources in you know, in, in the greater Asian continent, mm-hmm. which is why um, it's always wanted to break up Russia. I mean, we know that um, they've wanted to break up Russia, yeah. Um, but, um, you know, they failed in that. Um, in fact, Putin was uh, giving an interview to a, um, a Russian uh, journalist on precisely this point. Um, you know, he said that uh, in the early days, uh, you know, when the Soviet Union fell apart, he was naive about American intentions. And he still didn't believe um, that uh, the Americans had bad intentions for a good decade after that. He thought it was a sort of legacy, if you like, of thinking that was driving it. Um, And he began to realize, no, it's not the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Baker, Secretary Baker, when he was, I can't remember, you know, he was Secretary of State. He told uh, Gorbachev, you know, look, we will back off. We're not going to threaten you at all. We will withdraw. And what happened subsequently? 
We just piled weapons up towards the border. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, there is no trust at all. Um, no trust uh, that America would adhere to any treaty that um, uh, uh, you know might be entertained. And this, of course, means that the uh, Americans will not have a seat at the table when it comes to um, uh, uh, discussing the fate of Ukraine. I'm afraid not. Because the Russians just won't know. You know there's no trust, absolutely no trust at all. Mm-hmm. What do you think that, maybe we call it a victory in Ukraine for Putin, what do you think that ends up doing for the, let's say, the alliance between Russia and China? I don't think it has any effect on it at all. I mean, the Chinese, um, they've got a very different approach to geopolitics than Russia. Russia rather wants to do things like yesterday compared with the Chinese. I mean, Putin, I think... um, He's got a, um, you know, I think he wants to have a legacy, the legacy of being um, a great leader, Mm -hmm. um, if you like, a successor to Peter the Great. Um, Anyway, that's what they tell me, and I can believe it. Um, So I've seen enough politicians, I've been close enough to enough senior politicians to uh, understand that that's the sort of thing which they go into politics, (laughs) maybe hoping. Um, the Chinese have a very different approach. I mean, they, they see themselves as a civilization. It's a disparate civilization of about 40 odd different religions, castes, sects, sects, whatever, um, which left on their own would probably you know, fight against each other. So they need tight control. Um, and that's why that's that's why the the Uyghurs are being suppressed, really, um, because of the terrorist ambitions of the Muslims, uh, and the Uyghurs are Muslim. So you can see um, they take this very very long view. Um, you know, sort of you know, Confucius was what in our calendar it was something like five hundred BC, uh, four fifty BC, something around there, and here we are. Two and a half millennia later, more than two and a half millennia later, the Chinese civilization is still there. It is um, it has hardly evolved in many senses, but it is as rapidly adapting um, to uh, the wider world. Um, but it's not doing it in the way in which um, uh, America and the West do this. Um, America and the West, if you like, you know, they say, right, we have an objective to do this, and this is what we're going to do. And we're going to go invade the country in order to achieve it. They don't do that. They just stand back and let everybody else make mistakes. Mm-hmm. And that's been, you know, that's the the thing which I think has really frustrated the boys in Langley. You know, they keep on making the mistakes, and China just sort of stands back, shrugs its shoulders. Putin is different. Putin, um, he wants to move on. This is why he, um, you know, he will have the presidency of BRICS from January the first. And I think you might find that the agenda will reflect that. It will reflect a greater degree of urgency to um, promote, if you like, the Western hegemons um, and to get rid of the dollar. So it's going to be a very interesting year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's it's going to be interesting to see how, you know, the BRICS situation develops that if we do end up seeing that alternative currency, how that develops and these you know, these really steps along the way for yeah. the demise of of the dollar and what that ends up meaning for gold. But I really appreciate you helping us put all of these puzzle pieces together somewhat, Alistair. Is there somewhere you'd like to share with us other than goldmoney.com where we can read your research? Uh, well, I write exclusively for gold money. Um, and uh, so, so that, if you like, is the place to go. But various others republish it. Um, and uh, Gold Money, um, you know, they've been very, very kind to me. And um, you know, <laughs> they publish my stuff. Um, but I write a market report which goes out on Fridays, and you referred to that actually. You know, when we were talking about the commitment of traders figures and so on. Um, and uh, I publish a longer. Um, uh, article on sort of economics, um, precious metals or geopolitics, and that comes out on the Thursday. So so those are the two which I publish. And if you don't pick them up on the Gold Money site, well, just go to Gold Money, you'll find it. Gold Money Research. Open an account while you're there. 
<laughs> Excellent. Alistair, thanks so much for your time today. I look forward to speaking with you in the new year. That's very much my pleasure, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.